Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name is Faraz Jamil. I'm a second year medical student at the University of Cambridge. This is part three of the 2021 Section 2 walkthrough. And I'm going to show you how to do the Section 2 paper quickly and efficiently so you can maximize your marks. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss future videos. There's lots more good stuff coming, including a guide on how to choose a medical school. Okay, so welcome to part three of the walkthrough. So let's start with question 18. Dry air can be cooled and then fractionally distilled to separate its components, okay? What is the minimum volume of dry air needed to prepare a 25 decimeter cubed sample of oxygen using this method? Assume that all volumes are measured at RTP and that all gases are ideal. So, we know that oxygen is roughly equal to 20% of the air. So 25 times 5 is equal to 125 dm cubed to find the total volume. So what we basically want to do is look for the answer option that is the closest to 125 decimeters cubed. That's answer option D, which is the correct answer. Okay, simple enough. Now, for question 19. So, an electric shower heater is rated at 8.4 kilowatts and raises the temperature of flowing water from 16 to 36 degrees C. So one watt is equal to one joule per second okay what is the mass of water passing through the shower in a time of one second okay shc is 4200 joules per kilogram per degree centigrade assume that all electrical energy is used to raise the temperature of the water assume no heat is transferred to the surroundings so first of all so let's say q is equal to m c delta t now q is going to be equal to 8400 and that's from this, so 8,400 joules. M is equal to M, that's what we're looking for. C is going to be equal to, remember, this is 4,200 joules per kilogram, so it's going to be 4.2 joules per gram per degrees C minus 1. And that's just 4,200 divided by 1,000 converted from kilograms to grams. Now we can form an equation, 8,400, uh, and also delta T is equal to 20. That's from 36 minus 16. Okay, 8,400 is equal to M times 20 times 4.2. M, 4.2M is equal to 8,400 divided by 20. Uh, to simplify this, let's just say 84 divided by 2, which is 42. So that's going to therefore be... Four hundred and twenty. Therefore, m is going to be four hundred and twenty over four point two, and we can see that four hundred and twenty is one hundred times four point two. Therefore, m is going to be equal to one hundred grams, and therefore the correct answer option is going to be E, as we can see here. Just to recap what I did, I put it into standard units. First of all, converting the specific heat capacity to joules per gram per degree centigrade. I then use the equation here. And I also use the fact that one watt is one joule per second to convert the wattage into an energy, since we're asked, we're asked for a time period of one second. Overall, this type of question is not easy, but if you know what you're doing, you can do it quite quickly. And also, I want you to notice the math is quite simple. 8,400 divided by 20, you can just say 84 divided by 2 and then just adjust for the power of 10 difference. And 420 divided by 4.2, if you notice the power of 10 difference, you can just see that 4, 420 is 100 times 4.2, therefore m is 100 grams. So that's how you do this type of question. Right. All right, so question 20. This is a bit more of a difficult question, but I'm going to show you the step-by-step -step method to doing it. So the area of triangle PQR is 42 centimeters squared. Okay, the length of PR is 8 centimetres, cos theta is 3 over 4. What is the length of QR in centimetres? Let's call QR x. So let's start off by saying that half AB sine theta is equal to area. So that's the formula you know from GCSE, so area of a triangle formula. So if we apply that to this triangle, half times 8 times x sine theta is equal to 42. So 4x sine theta is equal to 42. x sine 
theta is equal to 42 divided by 4, which is equal to 21 over 2. Now, how do we find sine of theta? So that's going to be step two, sine theta question mark. So we have cos theta. So let's draw a right angle triangle. Call this angle theta. So remember, Sokotoa, ka is adjacent over hypotenuse. So if cos theta is 3 over 4, this is 3, this is 4. Therefore, this side, using Pythagoras, is going to be the square root of 4 squared minus 3 squared, which is the square root of 16 minus 9, which is root of 7. So sine of theta is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. Remember, soh. So root 7 over 4. So then step 3 is going to be simply dividing the right side by sine theta. x is going to be 21 over 2 divided by root 7 over 4, which is equal to 21 over 2 times 4, then divided by root 7, which is going to be 84 over 2 divided by root 7, which is going to be equal to 42 over root 7. Now we need to rationalize this. So you multiply both top and bottom by root 7. That's going to be equal to 42 root 7 over 7. We know that 42 divided by 7 is 6. So therefore, the correct answer is going to be 6 root 7, which is answer option H. As you can see, that question was quite involved. That was not an easy question. But the main thing I want you to understand is look at the flow of logic. I've neatly, neatly laid it out. And I've kept the calculation simple by working in fractions and square roots and not trying to bring in any decimals. So that's how you do this style of question. That's how you do it quickly. Make sure you have a good grasp of the formulae and make sure you always set your working out nicely. In the BMAT, it's really important to write stuff down and make use of the paper that you have. If you're looking for an online BMAT video course, head on over to sigmamed.co.uk. It's an online BMAT video course that teaches you the content you need to know, the exam technique you need to use, and goes over more than 30 worked examples to show you how exam technique is applied in the actual exam. It's made by me and my friend Hamza, both of us study at Cambridge, and it costs only £25, which as far as I can see, is the most affordable BMAT video course on the market, and also, in my humble opinion, the best. So I would recommend any student who is sitting the BMAT next month to go to sigmamed.co.uk and buy the course. It is an investment into your future and all of the students we've had so far on the course have been extremely satisfied and reported that it has significantly helped them with their BMAT preparation. So head on over to sigmamed.co.uk to buy your course and help you ace the BMAT like a Sigma. Right, so question 21. A nucleotide consists of three different subunits. Okay, we know that. A section of double shredded DNA consists of 600 of these subunits in total. Of these subunits, 28 are the base adenine. What percentage of the subunits of the section of DNA is guanine? So we have double shredded DNA, so let's visualize that. First thing I want you to notice, so you have 600 total subunits and three per nucleotides. So in total, there's 200 nucleotides, right? So 28 are adenine. 28 are thymine, since adenine and thymine pair, that totals to 56. 200 minus 56 is equal to 144. And that cytosine plus guanine. So that's the other two bases. So therefore, you have 72 times by guanine. So you have 72 guanine subunits. Then all we need to do is remember that each, out of these 200 nucleotides, each has three subunits. So therefore, you have 72 guanine over 600 subunits. And so instead of doing 72 over 600, what we can simply do is just 72 over 6, which is equal to 12. And we, we can just ignore the power of 10 and look for the answer, which is in the format of a 1 and a 2. And that's going to be answer option C, which is the correct answer. To briefly recap what I did, I visualized the problem. I interpreted the information correctly by understanding what they mean by nucleotide consists of three different subunits. And then I simply just did a simple calculation, which is 72 over 6, ignoring the power of 10, because the answer options are so far apart that I don't need to worry about it. Right. Question 22. Three elements from group 1 and three elements from group 17 are given in the table with their relative atomic masses. Okay. Of these elements in the table, one mole of the most reactive group 1 element, that's potassium, 
is reacted with the one mole of the group 17 element with the highest boiling point, that's bromine. So you have group 1, so that's one electron, group 17, that's missing one electron. So you're going to get a one to one element ratio, x and y. So now it's basically just potassium reacted with, with bromine, which is KBr, which is 39 plus 80, which is 119 grams. So because you have one mole, remember, you have one mole reacting with one mole. That's the important thing here. So one mole of potassium weighs 39 grams, one mole of bromine weighs 80 grams. So 39 plus 80 is 119 grams, which is the correct answer. So that's answer option 20, answer option D, which is the correct answer. Okay, so question 23. A high voltage DC overhead cable carries a current of 2000 amps. One 20 meter section of the cable has a mass of 120 kilograms. The cable section is supported so that it is horizontal with the current in the direction from west to east, okay? Earth's magnetic field in this location is 5 times 10 to the minus 5t due north and is horizontal. What is the magnitude of the total force exerted by the support on this section of the cable? Okay, so, so we know that F is equal to IVL, that's going to be equal to 2000 times by 20 times by 5 times 10 to the minus 5. Let's be smart here. So four zeros, so 2 times 2 times 5, which is 4 times 5, so that's 20 plus the four zeros over 10 to the 5. And that's just going to be getting rid of the zeros. So that's 2, right? Now, so, well, what I've done there is quite slick, but it's basically what I've done is 2,000 times 20 times 5, we have four zeros here. Here's the four zeros. What we're left with is 2 times 2 times 5, which is 20 here. And times it by 10 to the minus 5 is the same as dividing by 10 to the 5. So we've put that into a fraction. We have five zeros in total right here. So you just get rid of those and you have two, two newtons. So weight is equal to mg which is equal to 120 times 10, which is equal to 1200 newtons. So the support is going to make the difference between the upwards force and the downwards force. So 1200 minus two is equal to 1198 newtons support. That's going to be answer option D, which is the correct answer. Briefly recap what I did there. I did the first calculation using this formula. I was smart about computing the numbers. I turned it into a fraction and I also just collected zeros instead of actually going through long multiplication. Then what I did is I used the weight formula, found the weight of the cable, and basically deduced that the support must account for equalizing the force between the weight and the upwards force. That's going to be 1,198 newtons, which is the correct answer now. Question 24, another quite difficult question. So. Let's just draw a rough sketch. Let's say this is a 0 0.35 tangent, so 6, 7. Ignore the actual diagram just to visualize it a little bit. I know the points don't make sense, but radius and tangent are going to be at a right angle. So the gradient, let's call that M, of the radius is going to be equal to 7 minus 5 over 6 minus 3. Now, just so you understand what that is, that's the gradient of this, the radius. Because remember, the tangent is perpendicular to the radius, therefore the tangent is going to have a gradient which is the negative reciprocal of the gradient of the radius at that point, which is 6, 7. So that's just going to be 2 over 3. Um tangent is the negative reciprocal is equal to minus 3 over 2 and that is answer option b which is the correct answer just in summary what we've done we've drawn a rough diagram remember that the tangent is perpendicular to the radius find the gradient of the radius from that find the gradient of the tangent relatively simple so question 25 the family tree shows 
the inheritance of a recessive condition. Okay, and we have the key here. Remember, shape shows gender. Shading shows presence or absence of a condition. Which one of the which one of the following statements is slash or correct? So, individuals one and two are both heterozygous for the condition. That has to be true because one of the children has the condition. And if we think about the Punnett square. Let's say the disease allele is small a and the healthy allele is little a. The only way for a child to have the condition is if both parents are heterozygous. So that's correct. Option two, individuals three and four both heterozygous for this condition. That would be correct. Again, if we think of the Punnett square. Healthy parents are going to be AA. Disease is going to be AA. So it's going to be four times AA. So they're going to be heterozygous. Fine. Individuals 5 and 6 each have a 50% chance of being heterozygous for this condition. That would be in... That would be incorrect, yeah. And I'll explain why. So, one of the children has the disease. That means that both of the parents have to be heterozygous. So, it's going to be this type of situation. So... A 50% chance of being heterozygous. There's a 50% chance that the children of these individuals are heterozygous. But there's not a 50% chance that a healthy person is heterozygous. Because these three are the healthy alleles. So there's a 2 and 3 chance of HZ. Therefore, option 3 is incorrect. And the correct answer is answer option E. Okay, so question 26. So... Calcium nitrate Ca3N2 reacts with water to, to form calcium hydroxide and molecule X. No other products are formed and molecule X contains only nitrogen and hydrogen atoms. What is the empirical formula of X? So Ca3N2, Ca2 plus times 3, which is equal to 6 plus. 6 over 2 is equal to 3. N3 minus is our ion. So therefore, if you have a compound with H and N, H has a positive charge of plus one, therefore the basic empirical formula is going to be NH3, which is answer option C. Basically, what, how many hydrogens do you need to balance the charge of the three minus nitrogen ion? And that's how you do this question, relatively simple. And remember, it's empirical formula, so you just want the basic atom to atom ratio, right? Now, question 27. A train is sounding as its horn as it approaches a station. The engine driver hears a note of frequency F0 and of constant amplitude as the train slows down and stops next to a platform. A person standing at the end of the platform ahead of where the train stops also hears the sound produced by the horn. What happens to the amplitude and to the frequency of the sound heard by the person as the train slows down and stops? So, the amplitude, if you think about it, the horn is getting closer to the person, so the amplitude is going to increase. And the frequency is going to be decreasing to F0. So F0 is the original frequency. And as the train is further away, the perceived frequency of the person that, that the person is hearing is going to be higher. So the frequency would gradually decrease to its actual frequency, which is F0. So therefore, the correct answer option is answer option F. So thank you for watching part three of this tutorial. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any of the upcoming videos.